So now they're talking about doing, a, they're, they're going to come out with a Two-Face movie uh, because, you know, the, the Joker movie was such a success that the movie studios are saying, well, what other Batman villain can we do a whole movie about? But I'm really worried about this because remember the media promised us that with the Joker movie, there would be copycat Jokers, people that were so inspired by this story of, of a psychotic mass murdering clown that they would say to themselves, you know, I would like to be a psychotic mass murdering clown. That didn't end up happening, fortunately, but uh, I would be concerned about copycat two faces. That that could really happen. What if the film inspires copycats who go and burn half their face off and decide to make decisions based on coin flips from here on out? It, it, it that is a real concern. At least it is a concern that the media will uh, will insist is a concern at the very least. Now, um, what I what I want to start with today is this LGBTQICAPGNGFNBA. That's really the full acronym, by the way. Town hall. Um, that was last night with the Democrats on CNN. But the thing with the LGBTQICAPGNGFNBA town hall is that it was, in my view, um, a disaster for the Democrats, an unmitigated, glorious, if you're not a Democrat, disaster. And not just in my view, because I'm a crazy right winger. Of course, they don't care about my view. They don't care what I think. But they should care what normal, sane, moderate adults think, of which I am none of those things. But those who are in that category, they should, because you need to, you need to win a, at least some of the people in that category, uh, which is a dwindling category, I admit. But you need to win some of them if you want to win the White House. And, uh, and Democrats made that harder on themselves last night. Um, essentially, what they decided to do was to take their weirdest, wackiest, craziest, most bizarre, most extreme, most cultish beliefs and put them on display for four hours. And I imagine that every every non-leftist who watched the town hall or probably more likely watch, is seeing some of the clips today, they all have this expression while they're watching it. It's, it's going to be something like, that's, more, more and more, when, when, you, when you hear Democrats talk, um, especially when you give them time to really get into their views, that's the that, that's the expression of like seventy percent of the American population. It's just that kind of thing. Um, so we're going to get into this. We we will uh, get into the wild and wacky side of Democrat politics. But first, a word from Lightstream. Who doesn't want less stress in their life? Um, if high interest credit card bills are adding to your stress, then I've got a real solution for you. Pay off your credit card balances and save money with a credit card consolidation loan from my friends at Lightstream. You can get a rate as low as a 5.59, uh, f- uh, that is 5.95% APR with auto pay, um, which is much lower than the national average interest rate, which could be up to 20%. So this is much lower than that. Plus, here's the good thing, and it gives you some peace of mind, that the rate is fixed. Um, so you know that it's not going to rise. It's not going to jump on you. It's fixed, and that's what it is. The online application is quick. It's easy. Um, you can apply right from your phone. So you're saving money. It's 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 easy. You get peace of mind. Here's, here's some more benefits. Just for my listeners, you can apply now to get a special interest rate discount. The only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash Walsh, L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash Walsh. Subject to credit approval, rates include 0.5% auto pay discount, terms and conditions apply, and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash Walsh for more information. Okay, so the LGBTQICAP GNGFNBA town hall. Um, I confess that I didn't watch it myself. Football was on, so I had a choice. You know, I could I could watch Democrats pander to the gay lobby for four hours, or I could watch football. Tough decision. Ultimately, I decided to go with the sports option. So I, like most people, am catching catching the highlights today. And the highlights really play more like a, a blooper reel. Um, and uh, now it didn't have to be this way, okay? Keep in mind that the Democrats, like it or not, the Democrats have absolutely won when it comes to gay rights, gay marriage, everything in that vein. They've won. So um, in theory you know, to, to do a town hall on these issues as a Democrat could be a good move. It's a good play. Could be. 
Because if you spend the whole time talking about love is love, you know, uh, marriage equality, that kind of thing, if you just if you just pander about that sort of stuff for four hours, um, keep it in that lane. I think it would be a win for the Democrats. Because, again, whether you agree with or not, the polling is very clear. Most Americans either support gay marriage or just don't care. Um, but remember that the goal of the left is to fundamentally transform society, to, to change it, change our core values, change our culture. But they're kind of like the Joker in the other Joker, the Dark Knight. Uh, remember where he said he's, he's like a dog chasing a car. He wouldn't know what to do if he caught the car. And that's kind of what the, the left is like. They, they caught the car uh, in many respects, and they didn't know what to do next. So they just go off chasing a different car. Um, the drive to change, to transform on the left is never satiated. Uh, it, it, it never ends. I think in some ways it's appropriate that we call them progressive. Even though I wouldn't call this progress, personally, it is progressive in the sense it's always just moving. They have, no, they have no real vision for a society that they want to build and establish. They just always want to change and keep changing. Uh, even, if the, even if they're going back and undoing their own advances and their own victories, it doesn't matter. It's just always tearing things down and rebuilding. That's always what it is on the left. They can't rest on their laurels. Um, they have to go further, always further and further and further. Even on the gay marriage issue, they want to push more radically to the left. They could, if, if they knew it was good for them, they would just leave it alone. They would say, okay, we won that one. Uh, gay people could get married all across the country. Hooray, good for us. That's a victory for us. And you just, and leave it there. That's it. But they can't. So here, for example, is Beto O'Rourke, uh, Mr. Pander, the, the great, uh, the giant pander bear, advocating that churches lose their tax-exempt status if they don't abandon biblical marriage. This is from your LGBTQ plan, and here's what you write. This is a quote. Freedom of religion is a fundamental right, but it should not be used to discriminate. Do you think religious institutions uh, like colleges, churches, charities, should they lose their tax-exempt status if they oppose same-sex marriage? Yes. <laughs> there can be no reward, no benefit, no tax break for anyone or inst any institution, any organization in America that denies the full human rights and the full civil rights of every single one of us. And so as president, we're going to make that a priority and we are going to stop those who are infringing upon the human rights of our fellow Americans. That is a really great way to take a winning issue and turn it into a loser if you're a Democrat. Um, most people in America are fine with gay marriage, but they're not fine with penalizing churches over it. Because most people in America also are fans of religious liberty. And it's, on top, aside from the constitutional issues and everything, the attack on, on, uh, on religion and on faith, it's also, from, again, from a Democrat perspective, it's so completely unnecessary to, to, to go and start trying to force this on churches and everything. Although I've been warning all along that they will start doing that. Of course they're going to do it because they can't help themselves. It's, it's unnecessary because most churches are abandoning their, their uh, beliefs about traditional marriage anyway. So, the, so if, you're, if you're a liberal, you could just sit back for another 10 years. 10 years from now, there might not be any churches left, not because of any forcing, but just the churches on their own uh, are, are abandoning biblical teachings on marriage, just like they're abandoning biblical teach teaching on, on every other subject. But uh, again, they can't help themselves. Also, here's another way to make it a losing issue for yourself as a Democrat, uh, by approaching it like this. And a supporter approaches you and says, Senator, I'm old fashioned and my faith teaches me that marriage is between one man and one woman. What is your response? Well, I'm going to assume it's a guy who said that. <laughs> and I'm going to say, then just marry one woman. <laughs> I'm cool with that. <laughs> Assuming you can find one. <laughs> First of all, notice how Warren, in, an, in, in order to make this snide comment, in order to insult her ideological opponents, 
she first has to stipulate that the hypothetical person she's insulting is a man. So I'm going to assume this is a man. Why are you assuming that? There are just as many conservative Christian women as there are men. This is something they, they love. Democrats love doing this. Where they like to pretend that all of the positions they detest, uh, all of the ideas they abhor, are held only by men. They always are pretending that the people they're opposing are just men. And considering these are the people always accusing others of erasing them, you're erasing me. I'm being erased. In fact, we have an example of that just from this town hall. We'll play in a second. But they really are erasing conservative women. They just, if you're a conservative woman, it, it's it, the Democrats, they just pretend you don't exist. Pro lifers, there, there are so many con, uh, pro life women. In fact, there are more pro life women than men, at least active in the movement. movement. And anyone who's, you go to March for Life, you go to a, a you know a pregnancy center, you go to a f- any kind of pro life fundraising banquet. I've been to all these things many times, and it's going to be heavily women. It's going to be you know seventy percent women. Um, but the way that the left approaches the abortion issue, they pretend that all pro lifers are men. They just if you're a pro life woman, they just they're not even going to engage with you. They're going to pretend you don't exist. Uh, but that's what she does here. So. So that's why that you know, but but would she, here's the question for Elizabeth Warren: Would you respond that way to a woman? Would you say, "Hey, you're free to marry a man if you can find one, you ugly cow"? Because that, of course, is the implication of her insult when she says the the "if you can find one" thing is another way of calling conservative men unattractive, unappealing. And I'm just wondering if she would insult a woman like that. The answer is no. Uh, She's just going to pretend the woman doesn't exist. But it's on the issue of transgenderism that the Democrats really took the insanity of their ideology, put it on on a parade float, and marched it around town, pointing to it and going, hey, everybody, look at this. We're crazy. Look at our craziness. Um, I've got a bunch of clips to play in that vein. Let's start with this because I love it. This this one I actually enjoyed. and uh, Cuomo got himself in trouble for this, of course, but, uh, but I thought it was great. Good to see you, Senator. Thank Hi. you for joining us. How are Appreciate you? it. How are you? Anna, thank you guys. And my pronouns right. are she, her, and hers. She, her, and her? Mine too. All right. All right, first question. So Cuomo, Cuomo apologized immediately, of course. Uh, he came back like a, like a whipped dog with his tail between his legs. Gee, I'm, I'm sorry for my inappropriate outburst. But his joke was entirely appropriate, okay? It, it is manifestly ridiculous for people to go around giving their pronouns. The only appropriate way to respond to something like that is mockery. There really is no other way to respond to it. It is unserious, it is silly, it's ridiculous. And the only thing you can do with a ridiculous, silly, unserious thing is mock it, is laugh at it. You could tell Cuomo's reaction there was just, it was instinctive. It, 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 it's, it's, unless you've been, until you've been conditioned, every, every normal person, you know, uh, w- when, when someone comes up to them and introduces themselves with their pronouns, any normal person is going to respond like, okay, uh, you're going to respond with a smirk, a laugh, something. It's just a normal reaction because that's such a silly, ridiculous thing to do. It has to be, but you have to be conditioned. The left is trying to condition that normal reaction out of you. And that's why they focus so much on kids. Because they realize that adults who have grown up as sane people and have lived that way for 30, 40, 50 years, it's going to be really hard to condition you now to be insane. Uh, But you can do it with kids. It's a lot easier to condition kids. And that's why they focus so much on kids. And that's what makes it so insidious and evil. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But Kamala Harris introduces herself with pronouns. When did she start doing that? Well, 12 seconds ago. She spent, she's 54 years old. She spent 54 years of her life saying, hi, I'm Kamala. And now suddenly she's got a whole speech about her pronouns to accompany her introduction. And this is a theme. This is a theme that came up again and again. These candidates are mostly in their 50s, 60s. You know, uh, Bernie Sanders is, is, of course, 107, Buttigieg is, is 14, but, but 
You know, most of them are in their 50s and 60s. And so they went through their whole adult lives up until approximately yesterday, believing that men are men, women are women, believing that men have penises, women have vaginas, uh, believing that, you know, uh, you can't change your sex by mutilating your gen- your genitals. For their whole lives, they believe that. Even the most radical left among them. You're not going to find clips of Elizabeth Warren 20 years ago or 30 years ago suggesting that actually women can have penises. You're not going to find that. For their whole lives, they, just like everybody else in, in, in the history of humankind, has believed in the basics of human biology. And then suddenly, they've abandoned biology and adopted this gender theory superstition. But they can't explain why. You know, they can't explain what prompted them to decide overnight that, oh, no, actually men can have vaginas. Right. Here's a a great example of this dynamic. Watch this. So, Senator, quick follow. Speak to your evolution on this. Uh Uh-huh. In the 2012 campaign uh-huh. uh, for Senate, you criticized a judge's ruling that granted transition-related surgery yep. to a transgender inmate. You said, I don't think it's a good use of taxpayer dollars. Right. Do you regret that? Yep. No, it was a bad answer. And I, I think it was a bad answer. And I believe that everyone is entitled to medical care and medical care that they need. And that includes people who are transgender, who um, it is the time for them to have gender-affirming surgery. I just think that's important. And the appropriate medical care. So a few years ago, she held the very logical and correct position that taxpayers shouldn't have to fund genital mutilation. Of course they shouldn't. That is not health care. That's not a treatment. Okay, uh, a, a, a treatment, a, a, a medical treatment, it is a legitimate medical treatment when somebody has an illness or a disorder or a disease of some kind. And the treatment is, is the point of the treatment is to, is to cure or treat or manage that disorder, illness, or disease. If you're a man and you have a functioning penis, that is not a disorder. That is not a disease. That is not an illness. That is exactly how it should be. Everything is in working order. You're good to go physically. So it cannot possibly be legitimate health care or medical treatment to mutilate a healthy, functioning part of your body. Obviously. Now, Elizabeth Warren has believed that her whole life until now. She changed her mind. Why? Well, she can't explain Because her new position is completely ludicrous. It is completely without a scientific or moral foundation. She is pretending to have gone insane on this issue. And that's why it's so awkward to watch. Uh, And and they all are. None of these people, I mean, these are all basically sane, for the most part, basically intelligent adults. They understand biology. they, They understand. But they're pretending they don't. In fact, here's a question I'd love for someone to ask these candidates, though nobody will. Um, but, but here's the question. Very basic. Here's what you should ask them. When did you decide that men can have vaginas? And what prompted that change? Please explain that. Okay, You, you believed that, that men have penises your whole life. That's what you believed. Just recently, you decided otherwise. Why? Was there some sort of scientific breakthrough? Was there some sort of discovery that was, well, uh, no? Okay, well, then what was it? Did you slip and hit your head? I mean, explain this shift in thinking. Talk about flip-flops. You've got these people, they, 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 that's a pretty significant flip-flop. They have flipped on human biology. They've decided 60 years into their lives, oh, you know what? Biology isn't a thing, it turns out. I think they should have to explain that. I would love to hear an explanation. Now, uh, as, as, uh, as we have discussed, the left's embracing of transgenderism um, has, and I've talked about this uh, many times, the left's embracing of transgenderism has rendered so many of their other positions incoherent, obsolete, moot, 
Um, and last night demonstrated that very clearly because you had various points where arrogant, aggressive men got up and started lecturing or silencing women, which is usually something. I mean, if, if you want, if you want to set leftists off, if you want to, if you if you want to really upset them, uh, then all you have to do as a man is do is is do or say anything that could remotely be construed as criticizing or silencing a woman. Um. But, and, and usually they're, they're so extreme about it that, that that could even include, even just, just being a man and offering your opinion to a woman is usually enough to be accused of silencing a woman. But when it happened last night at various different points, uh, it was not only tolerated, but applauded. Because the men who were doing the silencing and the lecturing happened to be wearing women's clothes. Here's one example. Watch. And next, Secretary Castro, I want to bring in Shay Diamond, a singer-songwriter from Los Angeles. She currently supports Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Shay, what's your question? Um, it's Shea Diamond. Shea Diamond. Put that on the record. Okay. <laughs> it's on the record. Thank you. Yes, honey. It's violence to, to misgender or to alter a name of a trans person. So let's always get that right first. Um... Talk about mansplaining. This guy just accused the female anchor of violence for mispronouncing his name. Violence. It is violence to mispronounce his name. That was insulting, aggressive, pompous, arrogant. All of the things that feminists hate in men. All of the things that they find in us, even even if they aren't really present. Yet here is a perfect example of it, and they had no choice but to applaud. You've got a man sitting there like, honey, that's violence. Calling her honey. I mean, I don't, look, if that's not mansplaining, then I don't know what mansplaining is. Uh, Even more striking example, look at this. I just want to take a moment before I ask my question to validate the pain of our transgender siblings that demonstrated earlier and that have spoken up today, especially black trans women. I'm so sorry. I don't want to take this away from you, but let me tell you something. Black trans women are being killed in this country, and CNN, you have erased black trans women for the last time. Let me tell you something. Black Trans women are dying. Our lives matter. I am an extraordinary black trans woman, and I deserve to be here. My black trans sisters that are here, I am tired. I am so tired. I'm just sitting there, and it's not just my black trans women. It's my black trans brothers, too. Okay, think about what you just witnessed there. A, A dude stole the microphone from a woman and started screaming about how he's being silenced and marginalized. A woman of color, by the way, no less. So he he stole the microphone from a woman and, and, and started screaming. He, he took her time. He took her spotlight, her microphone. Made it all about himself. This was like a, a Kanye West, Taylor Swift moment. And this is one thing that, you know, in, in, these, in these men who are, um, who are, uh, identifying as women, I, I think one one thing you, you often find is an enormous arrogance um, and a total disregard for women, for how women feel, for their perspectives, their own safety, their, their privacy, all of that. These men throw all that out the window. They say, I don't care. Shut up. That's their message to women is shut the hell up. I'm going to do what I want. You, you know your place. Stand in a corner. Shut up. That's what these men are saying to women constantly. I mean, if a woman says, you know, I really feel uncomfortable if you come in, into our locker room and it, shut up. You're not allowed to say that, you bigot. And, and, and feminists and most feminists, not all, there are a few brave exceptions, but feminists and liberals, you know when they see this that in their heads they're recoiling and and they're pissed off about it. But they're too afraid to speak up. They're too afraid to upset these guys. And this is a here we, another example. He steals a microphone. 
all this talk about silencing women. Is that not silencing a woman? Didn't he just do that? And tries to make it about himself? They're, and, and meanwhile, they're doing a whole town hall. They're doing a four-hour town hall about LGBTQ, ICAP, GNG, FNBA issues. And that's not good enough for this guy. Oh, because it's, it's not specifically about him. It, this needs to be specifically about me. Not this woman. No, not those. Me. Me. This is all about me. By the way, the thing he said about trans people being murdered... Uh, he mentioned that, I think, in his uh, in his little rant there. And that's uh, that's true. Uh, trans people are murdered at a disproportionate rate, but it is manifest nonsense to claim or insinuate that these murders are hate crimes. So every time you hear this about the, the, the transgender, uh, transgender people are dying, they're being killed. Yeah, all that's true. It's tragic. It's terrible. Um, it, it, but anyone who claims that it's some sort of hate crime epidemic, they are lying. They are liars. They are despicable, disgusting liars who are exploiting real life tragedy and death and lying about it for political gain. They are scumbags for doing that. Because in reality, the reason why there's a disproportionate murder rate among transgenders, this is a this, this is just the fact. It's because there's also a disproportionate amount of prostitution and drug use, a vastly disproportionate amount of prostitution and drug use among transgenders. And so they are in those dangerous, high-risk situations, and they're more likely to be killed. That's, that's, that's why. And it's a tragic thing. It's a horrible thing. It's something we should be talking about. Why is it that these people are ending up in these high-risk high risk situations? Why is it? Let's talk about it. Let's get to the bottom of it. Let's try to actually save some lives. But when you sit there, as so many Democrats do, and just, you don't care about the lives, you don't care about life and death, it doesn't mean anything to you. These people dying, you couldn't care less. It's just, it is a statistic that you can throw at your opponents in an argument and lie about it. And I'm, I'm disgusted by it. Um, just as I'm disgusted by... People, uh, you know, who make everything about themselves. All right. And finally, speaking of being disgusted, I, I save this clip for the end because it makes me so angry. Uh, you know, you, you know how I am with this kind of stuff. I, well, I have uh, maybe you might say I have I have a pet peeve about child abuse. I don't know what it is, but uh, I'm just I'm not a fan of child abuse. I really don't like it. I hate it actually. And so when I see child abuse, it, 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 it makes me really angry. And then when I see a bunch of adults literally giving child abuse a standing ovation, that makes me, that just sends me over the edge. And so I'm going to play this for you, and then I will try to, as calmly as possible, offer a little bit of analysis of it. Here it is. My name is Jacob, and I'm a nine-year-old transgender American. Uh-huh. My question is... All right, <laughs> What will you do in your first week as president to make sure that kids like me feel safer in schools? And what do you think schools need to do better to make sure that I don't have to worry about anything but my homework? Oh, I like that question, Jacob. We're going to do this. Now, that mom there, um, she's apparently a radical leftist with the human rights campaign. Crazy coincidence, isn't it? Crazy how these radical leftist parents who are proponents of the left's insane gender theory, uh, it seems like they're often the ones who end up with transgender kids. I mean, just say it's crazy. How does it happen? It's such a coincidence. It just so happens. It's almost like this is conditioning. You know, it's almost like if a child grows up in a household where he is not given any direction. She, I should say, in this case with this child. Where she is not given any direction. And she is not... Um, uh, and nobody explains to her what it actually means to be a girl or be a boy. If she grows up in a household where this gender theory nonsense is, 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 is stuffed down her throat, 
she's going to end up transgender. I mean, that's it. It's almost like conditioning. I don't know. It's almost like these parents are conditioning their kids to have gender confusion so that they, the parents, can parade their children around like fashion statements. Saying, look at me, look how woke I am. My own kid is transgender. Look, look. It's horrifying. It really is. That young girl, uh, and, and she is a girl, she is being abused. This is psychological and emotional abuse of the worst kind. Because you're depriving her of a childhood. You're depriving her of an identity. You are forcing her to have an identity crisis. As I have said a million times, and I'll say a million more times, even if it was possible to choose your own gender, which it isn't, but even if it was, a child could not possibly make that choice because they don't even know what a girl or a boy is. They don't know what those words mean. And if you don't explain it to them as a parent, they're never going to know. And they also have no concept of the consequences of their actions. They cannot see beyond the, the, the nose on their face. They can't look into the 20 years in the future and ask themselves, you know, do, is this really something that I want? A, a, a nine-year-old girl is not capable of saying, of thinking about a lifetime living as a man, whatever that means, and, uh, and, and, and the implications of that and how that's going to affect her down the line. She just, she can't even formulate those kinds of thoughts. This is why I, a very simple question could be asked. Uh, when, a, when a young girl says, I feel like a boy, all you have to ask her is, what is a boy? I, that, that is, that's, it's not a gotcha question. That's, that has to be the most natural follow-up question. And it amazes me that you could have a, quote, transgender child, and you've had this conversation so many times, and you've never asked that. Another way of putting it, um, your daughter says, I feel like I'm a boy, or I'm a boy. What do you mean, daughter? What, what do you mean? What are you trying to say? What is a boy to you? In your mind, what do you think a boy is? And I guarantee their answer is going to be, because they are innocent children. They are innocent, naive children, as all children are. And so when a young child, who's a, a young girl says, I think I'm a boy, what she means is, I, I, am, uh, a, I find the things that I associate with boyhood to be appealing, i.e. superheroes, trucks, uh, you know, wearing is uh, wearing jeans. I mean, these 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 uh, these kinds of things. Playing, going out and rolling around in the grass, playing sports. That's what she's really saying. She's saying, "I would like to. I I, I am interested in these kinds of things that are traditionally masculine." Now she doesn't have the language for that. Or the thought process for it. She doesn't understand her own thought process because she's a child. And so that's where you as a parent have to interpret her thoughts for her. Because she doesn't understand what she's talking about because she's a child. I do this all the time with my kids. All the time my kids, are not, not with gender issues, but um, all the time my kids are... are, are uh, you know, saying that they want something or, you know, and, and I know as a parent, that's not really what they want because I know them and I'm their parent. I'm the adult. And so I'm stepping in and saying, no, you know, that's not, that's not really what you want. This is what you want over here. And then they go, oh, oh, right. Yeah. Even if it's something as simple as you're, you're at a restaurant and, and there are five items on the kid's menu. And, uh, and you know, you show and you, you give those options to your six-year-old. 
and, and this happens with my kids all the time. They'll say, oh, yo, I want the, uh, I want the hamburger. And I'll say, no, you don't really want the hamburger because we've, we've, you know, you've gotten the hamburger three other times. You don't finish it. You don't like it that much. I think what you really want is the hot dog. And then they'll say, oh, yo, yes, daddy, I want the hot dog. Because they don't know. Now, if a child can't even make a decision, can't even rely, doesn't even know really what they want on the, on the kid's menu, you think they can make a decision about what gender they are? If your nine-year-old girl wants to play with trucks and wants to roll around in the grass and wants to throw, throw a football and wants to play with superheroes, great. Let her. Fantastic. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, This was supposed to be what the left wanted. Before they decided that, oh, actually, we can all just change genders back and forth, back and forth. Before that, it was all about, you know, expanding these, these notions of masculinity and femininity and, and, and saying that, hey, we don't have to put a girl in a box and, and, and force her to wear frilly outfits and play with dolls if she, if she, if she wants to do, uh, you know, things that are more traditionally associated with boys. Great. And, and, and the thing is, that argument, I agree with that. Yes. Because, because ideas of masculinity and femininity are partially social constructs. That's true. There are places in the world where it is masculine for men to wear garments that look sort of like dresses. Um, there are places in the world where that's the case. And then in our country, it's not. So, so there, some of it is cultural. That's true. But boy and girl, these are biological categories. They are not social constructs. So a statement like, girls should act this way, X, Y, Z, that statement is going to be informed by culture and tradition, and it is going to be subjective for the most part. But a statement like, uh, girls have you know, female reproductive organs, that is not a subjective statement. That is a statement of objective fact. And it's the case no matter where in history the girl is located, no matter where on the map she is located. All right. Uh, let's see. Here's... Um, okay, well, a couple of very, very brief things before we, um, before we wrap up for the week. First, I saw an article yesterday about this Sesame Street has introduced a new Muppet named Carly. Uh, here, here's, here's Carly. Take a look at her. I don't know who the girl is there. Uh, I guess Sesame Street character. I don't know. But um, uh, Carly, this puppet, Carly, has a mother addicted to opioids. Yes, really. She, I mean, that is a hell of a dark backstory for a Sesame Street Muppet, isn't it? Now I know that gritty origin stories are all the rage these days, but geez, I like like let's th- th- there's got to be limits. And I get that opioid addiction is a huge problem. I'm not making light of it, and and that's what the Sesame Street people are saying that you know we want op- opioid addiction is a huge problem in the country. There are kids that are sadly, tragically growing up with with uh, parents who who are dic- addicted, and so this is supposed to help them deal with that. I just I don't know if this is the best forum for addressing that problem. I, I think that there are. There are a lot of very serious issues that kids deal with, sadly. Uh, not all of them lend themselves to puppets. That's just, that's my thought. I don't know. Uh, I'd be interested to know how you guys feel about that. Finally, there's a report uh, circulating that AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the avowed socialist, the champion of the working class, spent like 300 bucks on a haircut. Um, and I only know about this because I saw the articles claiming that conservatives are outraged by AOC spending 300 bucks on a ha- haircut. I haven't actually seen any outraged conservatives, so this I, I suspect this is another one of those things where it is um, there's a bunch of leftists outraged at right wingers for being outraged about something that we're not really outraged about. I, I think that's probably what it is. Um, I didn't even know that it was a thing to be outraged about until I read articles claiming that I was already outraged about it. Now I don't really care 
how much she spends on a on a haircut. Um, I do think it's always going to be a little ironic, a little hypocritical, hypocritical anytime a privileged left wing socialist goes out and treats themselves to a nice luxury like that. Um, it's not a problem for anyone else to do it. Like I said, I don't care how much you spend on a haircut. But when your whole thing, your whole mission in life is to shame rich people, then yeah, your own spending is going to come under scrutiny. I think that's fair. That's You brought that on yourself. But putting that to the side, uh, here's really the only reason I'm talking about this. The only reason this caught my eye um, is uh, I have been informed that actually $300 for a woman's cut, if it includes coloring, apparently, is a normal price. That's what I've been told. Not just by left-wingers trying to make an excuse for AOC, but even, in fact, my friend Ali Stuckey uh, on Twitter said that it's, it's, it's normal. This is perfectly normal amount for a woman to spend on this. And that horrified me to learn because my wife often goes to the salon to get her hair did. And, um, uh, and I know she gets it colored. And I never asked how much she's spending. My, my haircuts are like 18 bucks. And so I always assumed that she's spending something similar to that. Now, the fact that her cuts take nine and a half hours to do, I, you know, made me a little suspicious, but, but, uh, 300, my God in heaven, $300. How am I not homeless? How are we not starving with those kind of prices? How much, when she goes to get pedicures, how much is she spending? $5,000? I mean, what, what, you know, she came home the other day with, a, with a, some new makeup. Did she mortgage our house for the lipstick? I don't even know. I, now I'm, I just, I, I never really thought about how much this stuff costs for women. Here, so here's my thought. Um, I've got an anniversary coming up and uh, please nobody spoil this for her. Okay, I'm, I'm sharing this with you as the audience. And I just say, please don't spoil it because whenever I talk about my wife on this show, one of her friends, it never fails. One of her friends always texts her to let her know that I was talking about her. My wife doesn't watch the show, so uh, so but but her friends do. I guess because she has her friends monitoring it. And so they'll always text, oh, guess what your husband talked about today? Guess what story your husband told? So all I'm asking for you snitches out there, okay, you spies, just don't tell her this one because this is supposed to be a surprise. Here's my thought. Anniversary's coming up. Eight years of marriage, eight blessed years, and apparently, you know, six and a half million dollars of haircuts, it would seem, in that time. I'm thinking that my gift uh, will be a coupon that I'll give her for free haircuts and pedicures for life done by me. And, and that'd be pretty romantic, wouldn't it? I am, I am volunteering to take over haircut duty. Uh, I've, got, I've got scissors. I've got a pair of clippers. Uh, I've got a comb. Homemade is always better. That's my thing. It's the thought that counts. How difficult can it really be to, to cut a woman's hair? Especially if it's like long hair. My wife's got, you know, like shoulder length. So just, just it's, all you got to do is just go in and cut it. She wants to color it, just slap some shoe polish on there or whatever, you know, whatever, however they color the hair and, uh, and you're good to go. You're fine. All right. That's what my, my anniversary card is going to say. And we'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Hope you have a great weekend. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Robert Sterling, associate producer Alexia Garcia Del Rio, executive producer Jeremy Boring, senior producer Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens, edited by Donovan Fowler, Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there. Mm-hmm.